and welcome to the 20th episode of the Keen Minds podcast. We are covering the 13th episode of the fourth season of NBC's The Blacklist. It was Isabella Stone, written by the awesome Taylor Martin, whose birthday was right after the episode aired. So happy belated birthday, Taylor. Um, I'm happy Jen- birthday. <laughs> I'm Jen, a.k.a. Takata Cycle. And I am Tessa of Criminally Sane in Tumblr. And uh, let's just dive right in. What did you think about it, Tessa? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. it you know, every week it feels like I I can't be happier, but I am. It's amazing. I, I mean, everything is coming together. I'm starting to see all these threads being pulled in. And I am, you know, it was ecstatic. And I love when we get badass blacklisters are female oh they, yeah. tend, they tend to be awesome oh yeah it's this was just such a fantastic episode i and can i just make a comment i i don't know if i just haven't seen anybody talking about this or if i've just missed it but and i know we don't talk about the music much on here but the opening song shake a leg oh ACDC. and the prosthetics <laughs> i just i'm sitting there watching it and i went Wait a minute, is that Shake a Leg? Oh, someone had fun. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Well, the, the point list, I've done that with music so many times. Um, I mean, I remember the episode in which Liz is being buried, uh, and there is the song is talking about the granddad, and Red is going to see her granddad, you know, and it's, you know, it's a funny old man and all that. Um, th- there is The music is just unbelievable. It, oh. it, it truly is. It is. And so I got the biggest kick out of that. I just I, I just kept <laughs> laughing. Know. Every time I've gone through a couple rewatches now cuz it just it really is and I always hate to say this is my favorite episode of the season, but this one I think this one's definitely the favorite of the season so far. I mean, there have been a lot of fantastic episodes, but this one just hit all the right the right places for me. I mean, it it had a little bit of something for everybody. It really seemed to, and it's it's a nice thing when you wake up the next morning, you're like, oh, maybe there won't be a fandom meltdown. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I think people are always going to be unhappy with something. I particularly thought it was a fantastic episode. It was it was pretty balanced. We we started some very good arcs that that you're you're beginning. They kind of like were assaulted before. Now we're just starting to pick them up, like with wrestler. But in general, I mean, I love the blacklister. She was, she was evil, and and she was fun, and and she seemed to be having a great time doing all her evil things, which is always refreshing, you know. As much as sometimes we love to have those blacklisters with convoluted stories, sometimes evil is just plain fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every once in a while, there's a bad guy that's actually a bad guy. It's kind of nice. Yep. Um, I love the fact that it really called back to Vanessa Cruz with certain places in it. I mean, she was someone whose husband had been wronged and she was, her husband had been wronged and he had been killed because of it and she was getting revenge. Not always just on the, Vanessa Cruz went after the people that went after her husband, but Judith Pruitt was going after Criminals Criminal. that were uh, yeah. getting away with it, and so it was just I I loved that callback there and just the the whole thing, and we parallels. also have yeah I gotta love my parallels, mm-hmm. um and you also have Vanessa Cruz was either hired by Red Kate etc. We we don't know for sure if she accepted the job when Kaplan offered it to her, mm-hmm. uh, or if Red knows where she is now that Kaplan's not employed by him any longer um but red also has judith pruitt slash isabella stone and so has her in his custody so just there were a couple very nice parallels between the two women yeah i i thought in general um i love the way that she had no concern for anybody being hurt in the process um, sometimes when you get people with remorse, it can be interesting, and especially because we saw that last week with Natalie, that she was having remorse over the people she was wrong. But Isabella Stone had none. You know, some of these people were absolutely innocent, and she didn't care. 
She didn't care who she had to run over in order to get what she wanted. Yeah. She was truly vicious and made a glorious villain. I I was a fan. And she was pretty and she was elegant and you know, I there was it's it's just glamorous and 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 evil. It's perfect. It's like it's like um Solomon. Glamorous oh. and evil. <laughs> it was not too like there. Oh. Eddie. Um. <laughs> I'm so happy we're going to see him soon. Oh, I'm so excited over that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's take a look at Wrestler first because oh, yeah. I, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a Rest fan. I adore Wrestler. Tesla is my bromance of choice. I, I just like Wrestler. Now, it took me a while to get there probably halfway through or a little more through season one before I decided that wrestler was not hi- like for some reason I was convinced wrestler was hiding something first half of season one um, <laughs> like the one person that doesn't hide it is the one I'm thinking <laughs> is hiding something <laughs> but uh, well, no. it, it, yeah, you know it started out a little paranoid in this show mm-hmm. only got more um <laughs> but no it, it took me a while to warm up to wrestler and to really connect with him but once I did I kind of latched on and was like you were my second favorite um he and Reddington tie for my second favorite characters in this and so to see him be brought in in this episode and I've been thinking for a while and you and I've discussed it some Mm -hmm. that with the Hitchin thing and just various little very purposeful steps that the writers have taken this season with Ress especially in Esteban where he chose to to have Esteban, you know, uh, arrested rather than killed. Mm -hmm. Just very little things in which he was going against orders, basically, because it was right, and the whole things with Hitchin. I just, all of that has been building to something, and I've been convinced for a while now that, that, uh, we were, we were looking towards a deeper wrestler arc. I've, I've talked to a couple of my friends who are big fans of his, I'm like, just patience, guys. It's, they, they love their slow builds in this show. And it's frustrating, but they do love them. And yeah. I think the first one of those clues that we got was when Wrestler was the one who was perfectly understanding of Liz faking her own death to get away from Reddington. That was the first big clue. But, but, I, but I really do think that one of the big things that, I mean, like, like we said, there have been little clues. Mm-hmm. But the biggest one that I am now completely convinced they're teeing him up is they just pulled Wrestler into the biggest theme of the Blacklist family. Yes. And so they mentioned, they've never mentioned his, uh, besides his father who is deceased. And so, I mean, they've mentioned that as a way of explaining this is why Wrestler is the way he is. And at the time when he, when he mentioned his father, I made a gif and I said, this explains everything about wrestler, like in it a did. nutshell. It like that one line, and you're just like, I didn't uh-uh. know you could tell that much in that one little tiny scene. But bringing him in like this, bringing the brother in and the mother and all of that, they're tying him in with family, and he still has living family. He's now questioning job versus family which is something Liz is struggling with which is something that Tom's struggling with they are all struggling with this Samara Mm -hmm. did last season with her brother did she do the right thing did she let him go did she you know it's family versus duty and wrestler was really I mean Diego did such a fantastic job with this episode I just major major kudos to him and so it, it was brilliant to watch I, I also think that, that we were given early, very, very early uh, clues about this. When he got shot and Red asked him about Audrey, he talks about his obsession with Red ending his his engagement with, with um, Audrey and then how Red brings her back. So it's it's interesting because they they put this little things here. They talk about the cabin. Uh, Wrestler mentioned a very interesting thing then that he was alone in the hospital for weeks, and so that that brought a certain element of either he has no more family or he's somewhat strange from his family. 
And so it's nice to see him now. He does have a family. He has a brother. And I'm not sure that he has spoken with his mom all the time because he didn't even, apparently they didn't even know that his brother was sick or something. But it's interesting that they're bringing that back. And I think it's a brilliant um, parallel that you're drawing there that it, we've, now the only member that we haven't heard anything about their family is Ram. But we do know he's got a grandfather. Uh, yes, with, it, a, with a car. With the car, yeah. And so that's that's all we've heard. And he's got an episode coming up next week. Uh, this next episode is very Aram centered with him going undercover. So there's a good chance that we'll, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, a potential that we'll find out more about his background. You never know with the centered episodes. Sometimes they dive into the background, sometimes it's just the here and now. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's I found it fascinating that that parallel that you draw about finally we're getting to see Red uh, Wrestler family and when you get the family you know that we are really going into the themes. Yep. Because we had Wrestler going a little bit on that theme of that lost child when Audrey was killed and he realized she was pregnant. Um, we ha we draw a brief comparison between Wrestler and Red when Red tells him about knowing about loss. Um, and, uh, and all these things can be kind of like just dropped and left, which the Blacklist tend to do. They drop the things and then eventually they just started picking up and ended up with a nice little bouquet of, of things that suddenly all come together. They're, it's beautiful. Slow build. They, they are just, they are the kings and queens of slow building. And I, I think that sometimes as the audience, we want all the answers right now. We, their movie quality and the way they present stuff to us. And so I think a lot of times we watch it as if it's a movie. And the movie, you sit down for two hours and you have your answers by the end of it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're watching week to week to week to week. And you can't, while they have movie quality production, they can't give all their answers away. <laughs> mm -mm. And so it really is. They're very good about slow building. You just have to have the patience and you have to watch carefully for all those clues. And... Remember back to season one, season two, where all these little things are picked up and brought about. And it's just, it's, I, I love that stuff. And that mm -hmm. is, that's my favorite. That's probably one reason I love this show as much as I do. That no matter how much I feel like something might be a loose end, it rarely is. They come back. It may take them a while, but they do come back. Yeah, I, I I have a list of the things that have been dangling ends, and slowly but surely I've been crossing them off. So I I have absolute confidence that by the end every single thing is going to be picked up. So it's just great, and I mean this this with with wrestler is just exactly what I'm talking about. They bill him, they now this 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 anger in this he's getting to a point where he's not sure that his choices have been right. Exactly what they did with Samar. You know, he chose the work. He chose uh, the red, red intern. And now he keep to choose to keep in the task force because he knows it's a, about the body count and they're doing good. Yeah, and I, I think the frustrations with Red right now are getting really high in the task force. With Wrestler, he's looking at, you know, is he going to choose this criminal that he has spent, he's already lost a lot chasing down. Now mm -hmm. he's protecting him. I, and he feels like, he made the comment in the episode on Thursday, he said he might as well be signing our paychecks. I think when it gets to that point with Wrestler, it's, it's kind of like with the Cabal last season. It just threw him for a loop to understand that his superior superiors worked for this criminal organization and were pulling the strings. That For a man like Wrestler, that's just gut-wrenching to understand that while he thought he was doing good, he was actually accidentally working for the bad guys. And, mm -hmm. and, I and now he's... He feels that way about Reddington, and I think that's where it's going to come around with Hitchin, is the where is that breaking point for Wrestler, which he knows Hitchin is, is Cabal. It may be when he finds out that Reddington is technically running the Cabal now, and that Hitchin is now working for Reddington. If that comes out, I could see Wrestler just 
just, just something extreme coming about from that. It's, I don't know what, I don't, I'm not sure I'm even willing to venture how far he would go with that, but honestly, for his character, I can't blame him for it. I mean, that would just break, I don't want to say break him, because I don't think it's going to, you know, shatter him beyond repair, but I think that it's going to force him into a direction Uh. of growth. I am I'm gonna venture something that when when and if that that happens, Red wrestler might surprise you by understanding exactly what Red is doing. Because I think that when Wrestler got that shock to the system that, that was understanding that the cabal went all the way up and was basically running the government, I think that that something flipped there and and he understood a bit better what red was doing um Maybe. and and he had a time especially in the in in season three when he was so out of it apparently like he was just making snide remarks about tom about Gliss, about red about cooper he was just bitching and moaning and here we are Slowly but surely, that has turned around, and I think that wrestler might have started to understand that when you get when the evil goes so deep and so high, there's only one way down. You gotta go in. You gotta go in, and you gotta take it from the inside. And you remember one of the songs that we've used in the blacklist, "The Devil Inside." <laughs> it's it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to that. It's it'll. I think it'll depend greatly on how it comes about, on if he'll be against or for Red. And, I mean, I guess there's a possibility if he realizes that Red is not as bad as he appears. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, right now he really feels like he, he's being used by a criminal to further his criminal empire. Mm-hmm. And that basically they're being thrown some bones for it, but overall, you know... It, the means don't justify the end, or the, the yeah. ends don't justify the means with this. Yeah. I also think that that wrestler, like a lot of the fans that are so uh, upset because they want the procedural back, is that the, the task force now is faced with understanding that even though they had no idea what Red was doing before, Red has always been doing the same thing. He has an agenda. And in exchange for that agenda, he's throwing them the blacklisters. Well, he's he was very clear about that in the beginning. I mean, he's <laughs> it's one of the few things he's never fudged around on. That yeah, of course he's using the FBI. He wouldn't be in business with them if he weren't getting something out of it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So so I think that that all in all, the the I, I'm just. So looking forward to seeing those developments because I think that we might, Wrestler will be faced, I think, with a, with a big choice. Either, either he contents himself with bringing the little guys or he would have to understand what Red's doing and go and bring the the big whales. Mm -hmm. I think that's the choice. It's interesting to watch though, because the frustrations, like I said, have really been skyrocketing especially in uh since Mm -hmm. since kirk i think kirk was the breaking point for cooper um i because while they were chasing kirk down after liz came back and everything uh, up until that point or um cooper and red had actually been forming up sort of a bond i mean red was the one that went went there at the uh the beginning of season two and said listen i know you're retired but you're coming back he was the one that brought him back. He, Red and Cooper just have really developed a lot of... It, it seems like they've almost developed a friendship between them. And there's certainly been a respect developed there. And I think there was a lot of respect, professional respect to begin with. Especially mm-hmm. Red to Cooper. Not that he would admit that early on. But it's he's certainly been more open about it in recent seasons. But I think that when Red let... Kirk go Cooper just couldn't stand by it this was there was a woman dead from the from the the um wedding 
Mm -hmm. nearly lost Liz. They nearly lost Agnes. They put a whole lot of effort, time, government resources, everything into going and finding Agnes, fighting Kirk. They broke the law to get to Kirk. There's a lot of stuff that could come back on them eventually if they ever got found out. I mean, they robbed a bank to get to Kirk. (laughs) And the, the task force did. Cooper... He bent that binding on that rule book pretty hard during that point. And that was all on him. Don't get me wrong. They were choices that he was making. But he went to that limit and went mm-hmm. beyond that limit. I think with the understanding, not that, Kirk, that he was never there to kill Kirk particularly, but, I mean, he was willing to let it happen at the end of season three when Red went to go Mm-hmm. sniper him and he you know wrestler was the one that stopped that i think that the moment that red let kirk go it just it brought things into perspective for cooper that this is not as even of a relationship as i thought and i think that that kind of came around when when red just made the demand like i need you know as soon as you have her in custody i need a few minutes with her and Cooper's like, no, absolutely not. You know, you don't make these demands. We are basically when when Wrestler said he might as well sign our paychecks, I think that Cooper's feeling that way as well. And he's going, mm. No, I'm putting a I'm putting my foot down, we're putting a stop to this. You don't sign our paychecks, we work for the US government, and you work for us. It it's certainly um you know, it's also, you know, in a way <laughs> like vultures Red is is spiraling down, and at this moment, Cooper can assert a bit of dominance in there, and and he's sweeping in and he's doing it. That's what anybody would do. Um, so I respect him enormously for doing that, because that shows that he can understand the situation and take advantage of it uh, to do what he's supposed to do. And and then we've had Samar. Uh, complain that she's not paid enough to get shot at just for Red. Uh, wrestler complaining that, you know, they basically work for Red. Uh, Cooper has been, you know, telling Red, no, 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 we, this is not what we do. And Liz as well. When, I mean, and we can go into this in a few minutes with Liz more, uh, you know, and more <laughs> in depth, but she's come and said, you know, don't you tell me about your criminal enterprising because I, you are my CI. You know, she's made it, she, she's really drawn that line recently with, you are my CI. Mm-hmm. And so I think even Liz, to a degree, has gotten, you know, she, she's pitched a little bit of a fit recently. But I think that has, I, I think that comes back more towards the honesty thing and the openness thing than than what's been bothering Cooper, Samara, and Wrestler. Yes, it's a very different relationship. Um, and I also think that eventually this is going to come down on Liz. And in my my personal, uh, I'll, I'll give you my personal uh, uh, prediction of what Liz is going to end up doing. But I, I think that Red, everything is closing in on Red. Um, and I think that Red is going to have to open up to the task force if he wants to continue. He's going to have to tell them what he's trying to do. Because everything is coming, closing in, and he's left with every day less and less allies. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like Dembe told him, he said, people keep dying around you. And I don't know if the timing was appropriate with Dembe saying that, because it kind of was breaking my heart that everybody's going after Red when he's, you know, give the man five minutes to grieve his friend that he was desperately trying to save. But... I, I do feel like the task force, if he were more open with them about things, and because right now they feel very used. They feel used without an appropriate amount of return from Red. And they feel like they're being used to build his empire, to do his dirty work, carry his load. And until mm-hmm. he comes to them and says, this is what I'm doing with this. This is not it. Because I do think it's bigger than the criminal empire. Because Red's been kind of forced into that, from what we can tell. There, there's and something- he has enough to live. I mean, it's, he could retire tomorrow and live yeah. happily with all his security and all that. Yeah. And it's-, it's, I mean, obviously, if he's, you know, just dropping 25 grand into uh, his buddies. <laughs> I mean, he's he, buying. He just buying lost this, buying 20 
200 million and he's like okay i guess it's gone yeah. <laughs> I, I can't even think of 200 million and he's just like oh well i guess it's all gone huh i think we're in the wrong business maybe we should be criminals i don't know <laughs> somehow i think i would never be as good a criminal as red <laughs> Okay, scratch that. I know I would never be as good of a criminal as Red. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Well, one thing that is interesting is that that um, the black the point what I was trying to make is the blacklist the Cooper and Red and Liz all throughout season one they thought that Red was bringing them fun criminals that you know were really bad guys and they were like man their careers were taking off. Most people. Don't get to color them that many criminals in a lifetime in the FBI. These guys were doing it weekly. And I think that it Liz connected the dots in season one based on, on Tom's notes. But most people have the same thing as, as, as the task force. Oh, okay, and brush it off. And then we come to season two, and it's we we think oh the cabal is coming so we kind of forget that this is all very personal to Red and he takes and make it personal, um, and it, it's only when we get to season three that most people are like oh this is a baby drama family drama, it's always been a personal drama it's always been a family drama, but it wasn't evident to most of the audience even though the clues were like right there. Um, it's also now evident to the task force. We've been, we're doing Reddington's bidding. And I think that's what gets, I think the task force is, is kind of like um, getting the blunt of that. Yes, we've been doing what Reddington wants and we're not very sure why we're doing it. And just the, the little crumbs of the criminals are not, may, maybe they're not enough for the things that we are giving up for this. The ends do not justify the means for them any longer. Mm. Or at least bordering on that. Yeah, I think it'll be very interesting. And I know the taglines for, for this coming week are, you know, asking if Red's gone too far, or splitting. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think that it's probably going to be a... I, I would think it's going to be a bigger arc than all of that. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I've kind of been trying to think what kind of bombshell they can drop before the uh, spring hiatus that won't affect redemption because they've, they've got sort of a weird lineup this year with the spring hiatus. They've dropped their, their spinoff in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And so it is a hiatus, but it's not. <laughs> and so, I mean, because this is taking, I mean, it's not like it's taking place totally away from the blacklist. And so they're going to have to have something that can bring people back to, the main show when they comes back some some mm -hmm. sort of big bombshell that won't disrupt you know the black the, the redemption yeah because I, Tom's I, so I, keyed yeah. in with everybody with Liz and Liz to everybody else and I mean wh while his ties to the task force are more or less through Liz he, he does have some ties to them but it just there, there are certain things that you can't do that you, yeah. you'll have to have that timing space in between there that allows for eight weeks to happen with not knowing what's going on here so it, it it whatever it is i think that the last episode of this the 15th is going to be the setup that is going to take a little time and then we're going into that last uh, so that will be setting up that last arc for the year maybe red goes into hiding or something you know just disappears off the face of the planet fake death Oh, I'm not another fake death. <laughs> oh, come on. We have so many. And now we I know. know that, that Christopher was a, a fake death, too. Come on. We got to have another oh, one. Oh, God. I... Okay, so I, I think we've about covered the task force. So let's go in. When we were working on our notes, everybody, <laughs> we just finally said, Red, Liz, and Tom, we can't separate these three this week. There was so much. I mean, it was, oh, I'm just... This was just such an amazing episode. I seriously cannot. <laughs> and and cannot I'm going to start this. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of, of uh, patting my own back. But come on. 
in in a show like this that drops these bombs in and unexpected development, I gotta say, Jen, you killed it. Oh, I mean, you've been predicting this kind of development with with Tom and Liz forever and ever. You've written fan fiction that is just like that scene. It just looked like it was taking out of that fan fiction. So how you feel about that? I'm kind of excited. <laughs> I, I've said for a while that the way that I gauge how well I understand the writers on the blacklist is how well I can predict certain arcs. Because I, I deal in character development, and and so I, I tend to focus on the Keens, obviously, because I, I feel like I understand those two the best. And and so that's, that tends to be where my predictions lie, for the most part. Uh, I'm certainly not nearly as, as spot on with predictions with the, ta- you know, the task force on whole, and I don't tend to make huge overarching predictions and theories on the show on whole. Um, mine tend to be more focused, and so I, <laughs> I and was you actually killed them. I was actually talking last week to a couple of friends on Tumblr, and I said I have this mental image that keeps popping around in my head of this scene of Tom sitting on the floor in their living room with all of his research spread out, and Liz walking in the door and just stopping and standing next to him and going. And and him looking up and going, oops, you know, and her going, you need a board. And he's like, "Eh." (laughs) you know, because, and just that acceptance there. And the scene popped on, a friend of mine from Tumblr sent me a message, she goes, you are a witch. (laughs) Because apparently that's the go-to in fanfiction is when you predict things, somehow you're a witch? (laughs) I don't know. But I've been called a witch twice by two different people in fanfiction. I... Not sure why that's the go-to, but it's funny, well, and, and it's become an inside joke between several friends. And, you, and you've written scenes that are, that are just so similar to this one, in which, you know, that she wakes him up, and, and she's, you know, he he, he just goes off in the middle of the, of the afternoon, she's feeding, she's feeding Agnes, and suddenly she sees this, and... and you know, they, they start going into that. So that dynamic between the Keens was like spot on. So kudos for you and pat on the back. And oh, now for me, I can pat my own back. Because didn't I say when we were doing our series, uh, our Hayato series, that the, the character development for Red were, was going to be measured by Tom? Yes. Yes, and all about to Tessa, she called that one. Um, because it, for those that didn't listen to the hiatus episodes, I my statement was I felt like Red's character development was kind of slow, and Tessa pointed out and completely jarred and redirected my point of view on this, that most of Red's character development has come through his dealings with Tom and how he reacts to Tom. And when I started changing my lens of how, because I was looking through the, the Liz and Red lens, and I'm going, oh, he keeps just not telling her things. It's so frustrating. Red, just be honest with her. Listen to Dembe. Just tell her the truth, you know? <laughs> and so when I kind of shifted my lens of focus, I'm going, oh my gosh, Tessa's right, which is kind of a mantra through the episodes these days, is oh my <laughs> gosh, Tessa's right. <laughs> um... I swear, if Carla turns out to be Katarina, I'm gonna just like, I, I, I'm gonna be so impressed. <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent convinced of that. However, I am convinced that Emma is Jennifer. So I, that definitely makes sense to me. I mean, I could totally see that happening, especially with his reaction to her. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Tessa gets the. Uh, the T- Tessa has. Reds, uh, a couple of ba- a couple of bag bags on the back for that one, and I, I, I was ridiculously happy with that scene in which, you know, we get the we get the kings there, and you know he's like I don't need I don't can't pretend that I care, and Liz goes like, well I don't know about that, and it's interesting because. We see another point of character development for Liz, for Red, Red and Tom in there, in this in this little family, dysfunctional family that tries to kill one another occasionally. 
Uh, <laughs> just laugh. <laughs> She's trying so hard not to laugh. <laughs> Making fun over faces. trying not to laugh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, you know, then, then she goes and Tom and Red ask how he take it. That is huge. It's huge. I mean, the fact that, that Red is bringing into Liz and Liz says, you know, he's unconcerned. And Liz immediately changes the subject. But Liz, when coming back, she has taken Red's advice and says, you know what? It's fine. We don't need to dig anymore. Well, I so think that that's part of taking Red's advice. I also think, I, I personally see it's it as giving, a character- I see it as a character development issue because I mean we we've talked about multiple times how Liz is very self focused. She she's yes. admitted to herself she's admitted herself that she has narcissistic narcissistic tendencies, and we see that in the way she reacts to other people. the The searching down family roots thing is her thing. That's something she focuses on. She's obsessed with it. Tom stood by her through the whole Kirk or- ordeal, and I could see where she'd go. This is important to me. It should be important to you, too. Look, it's right in front of you. Go for yes. it. And she did uh, back in, in 4A to a degree. You know, if if your father showed up on your doorstep, wouldn't surely you would have questions. And he said, well, I met my mother, and I don't. I don't care. And and so she's back on this. That, and I just, I love the way she was so gentle and careful with him waiting for the reaction, gauging the reaction to see how best to handle the issue with his father dying because she knows that as much as he denies it, that it's going to hit him. She's aware of this. She knows him well (laughs) enough to know even if he's lying to himself, you know, and, and she kind of gauges that. And I think that when she changes her tune, that evening when she gets home or two evenings, Mm -hmm. whatever the case, whenever she gets home after this case, I think a lot of that is her saying he said he doesn't want to follow up on it. It's stressing him out. He will come to it in his own time. Kind of like with the passport. She didn't say anything about it. She let him come to that conclusion on his own because he needed to. Mm -hmm. And it's part of him learning how to cope with, with emotions and dealing with very emotion, you know, emotionally jarring situations. While she's there to support him, he does need to learn how to handle them on his own. He can't just go, well, Liz, how do I feel about this? You know? And And also notice that in there, she even tells him this time, uh, uh, that would be your dream job. I did love that. It's And it goes back to the point of this was not about Tom going undercover. This was about Tom going undercover for Reddington and his criminal organization. Mm-hmm. Halcyon is government sanctioned. It would be looking into his past. It would be checking in on his mother. It would be working for a government sanctioned organization. And he would get to go undercover. It would be the dream job. And it's one exactly. that the wife is totally cool with. And yeah. so... I, I, I thought that in general, I mean, this and viewing it from both points of view, which I think in the blacklist in, in a character like Liz, you can't go simple like you can't go simple with red. Layered. So it's not it's 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 probably a combination of Liz giving Tom what he needs and the space he needs and accepting that not everybody has the same point of view as she does. And at the same time, listening to Red and saying, you know what, maybe there is something here. Um, it, it was a it was a beautiful scene and one in which we have had blowouts, we have had arguments, we have had Liz being really bitchy with Red um, and bitchy with Tom, and you know all of them going at each other. And finally, we we had we had a scene. In, in this, in which Tom calls Red and says, I need to see him. Oh, Tom, that was so amazing. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> that scene was like, yes, yes. I, you know, I was like thinking, yes, he was a fanboy. He was fanboying over over being Legat and like, oh my God, you were Legat, but Legat is real and he gets to be Legat and he's, you know, a little fanboy. I do think that there is something that growing up, maybe, you know, people like Reddington, especially if the major trained Reddington, which is what I think. I also, 
I and I've mentioned this before. I think that Tom has a bit of you know a a professional crush on kind of like a Rom does, uh, just a professional crush on Red. That he, when he was growing up in Saint Regis, I imagine Red was the gold standard. The you know if you get a job for Raymond Reddington, you have made it in this this career. And at you know mid to late 20s, he's being hired by Reddington. And so I, I think that, that was probably, for his line of work, just a dream come true. Not only yeah. that, but Red asked for the best. And yep. he yep. and, and he, he was, was the best. The best. And yeah. so I, I do think that, and then I think that, like like me as a viewer, I, I say that I sometimes have trouble remembering that Red is not omni omniscient. I think the the deeper Tom got into everything when he worked for him the first time, I think he realized this man is not like, like not infallible, not omniscient. Yeah, and and he really got kind of a a reality check with Reddington, and it took him a while to figure out that Red was not using Liz particularly like that, but I do think that some of those early ideas of this is Raymond Reddington, oh my gosh, still remain. I mean, because Red's been in the business for a long time. I mean, Tom has too, but Red's been in the business longer and has been huge in it longer. And so I, I can imagine his teenage years were idolizing this man of sorts yeah. i mean it, it could be and and so especially if what i think that that the major train read probably when the major wanted to drive a point of how to do things red was probably the gold standard you know and like as, raymond reddington <laughs> yeah you know, as i imagine hey you want to do a murder you do it like, like that you know and now he gets to be like that but that scene he calls and that is a you know and I kept remembering as I was watching that. And then in, when I did the rewatch, it's like, I have to back up, watch a few of the old scenes and then watch the scene again. And I was stunned by the character development in both characters because they start with red sending Zamani to got him. Um, then, you know, they, they, he delivers him tied to a chair, uh, Tom sends him the, the, the tattoo of the uh, associate. It's, this is been, you know, and then they come towards Liz and, you know, Red calls him like, you're not going to marry her. Uh, they have the gun in the church. And eventually, this is like, he's coming to Red as a son, as a son-in-law. And Red's reaction to him was just so per. I mean, it's it yeah, was he, so he's still curt with him to a degree, but it's a different it's a different tone he speaks to Tom with. It's it's very much a son in law that he's looking at. And he made the comment, you know, you have a wife, you have a child, you have a life. You know, focus on that. And I I am very curious about what Red said about Howard Hargrave. Because the conversation between Scotty and Red in season three, you know, he talked about how fond he was of, of Howard. Scotty told the story about uh, about them working together. I mean, it sounded like there was a great deal of close history between Howard Hargrave and Raymond Reddington to the point that I, I've wondered if... Um, Red you know, didn't work for with Howard in well, those missing too. four years? Maybe, um, but my my wonder has been if maybe Red knew Christopher as a small child, if there was a link there, if you know, and I I've got this lovely little head cannon that that Red gave little God's Christopher, son, yeah, the godson <laughs> thing, um, that Red gave Christopher this little boat as a kid because he wanted, you know, Red wanted to be a ship captain, and obviously they spent time out on the beach and such and so like i've got this little little idea of red giving little toddler christopher a boat to play with and it being christopher's favorite toy you know <laughs> it's I, I would love for something like that to come up in which red knew little christopher because i i cannot believe and red lies red Red exaggerates, Red leaves a lot out. And so, mm -hmm. and someone I was talking to over on Tumblr, um, 
she we were talking and she she made the comment that yes red did say they had a brief professional relationship that doesn't mean there wasn't a longer friend re- friendly relationship he just didn't mention that and i went that's red, red speak, speak. <laughs> yeah just because you're leaving something out doesn't mean you're lying and but, he's uh, he's trying to gear tom towards something whether he's tr- actually trying to gear him towards halcyon whether he's trying to gear him away from halcyon if he thinks howard's really dead then he may actually be trying to gear him away from halcyon at this point because he may I, find it as a dangerous thing i i think he was uh, i think that red gearing tom towards halcyon and his mother and 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 finding answers so was related to liz being dead i think red is afraid that that Tom going to Alcyon will uncover things that he's not ready to let Liz understand or know. That's a good possibility, especially, once again, going back to theories, if Tom and Liz knew each other as kids, if Christopher and Masha knew each other as kids. And I I have a feeling that that box of Tom is going to come around and be the thing that brings things around. Yeah. Um, I also noticed... In, in that scene with Red and Tom, Tom, Tom never doubted that he's Christopher Hargrave. Which, never. Which is bizarre to me that he took Red at his word. Like that, that's kind of, I'm like, that shows so much for, he trusts Red now. Completely. And it's, that's I, huge. See, I, you go for that. You're the character development. I, I think that when Rhett told him that and when he was at Susan's home, something ran through. So either he was something in his subconscious were picking things up and or there is memories that he has and maybe he has dismissed. Maybe he has never discussed them with anybody. Maybe looking into his mother's eyes. Um you know, have done something, he remembers, triggers a little something. But something, usually for Red, anything that Red would say, they would be taken with a grain of salt by Tom. And the fact that he didn't even, he's, he got it. It was like once he said it, those things that you may have in the back of your mind, and when somebody sets them, you know, mm-hmm. in, 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 in speak, in, in, in speech and in, in out there, you understand and see the truth of it they ring true and you know that they're true yeah and that's a possibility but uh, then or, then he's or like everything else it could be layered in a bit of both <laughs> yes i i also i also think um it was a beautiful beautiful scene because tom was really really um stressed out and one thing happened that I know that in a lot of the detractors, they've been screaming that they're not married, they're not married, they're not married. Well, the sacrament of marriage, at least in the Catholics, it's the officiants are the people who get married. So in reality, it matters very little if there was a ceremony being conducted. That means that they are married. And Red acknowledges his relationship with Tom is now that of a son-in-law. He acknowledges that they're married. It's this is a different thing, and I think that a lot of 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 the detractors that treat Red as omniscient and infallible, they they gotta understand that whatever objections Red had before, he doesn't have them anymore. Yeah, he's he could least, have used this yeah. to push Tom out of this life, and he's not doing this at all. Yeah. In fact, he's he... had several opportunities to do that recently and chosen not to. And so their fight earlier in the season when Liz went to, to Red and was so frustrated when Tom went behind her back and, and uh, tried to, when they were looking for Agnes, Red could have used that. And instead he said, oh my gosh, well, he, he set that up. How cruel. You know, and yeah. talking about Kirk, not about Tom, never said yeah. one word about it. And so, like, there's been multiple times recently in which Red had golden opportunities to to knock Tom out of the, you know, put put distance between them where he would have before, and he's chosen not to. So I think it's fair to say that he has at least accepted the fact that Tom is not going anywhere. 
I, I think it's gone farther than that. I think that Red is now okay uh, with it. And, and I think that the fact that he's giving Tom very sensitive jobs within his organization is telling that he's, he's cool. Yeah. He's okay. I think that, that maybe a lot of... He has worked out, and this comes to, again, one of my theories. I think that that speech about the truth that he gave um, Magnuson mm -hmm. was huge because what the things that he read has hold truth that now he's not sure of. And among of those was... We always said, oh, what's going on with Red and Tom? Something got to be wrong with Tom because Red hates him. Then it became apparent Red is working his issues with Katerina through Tom. And the fact that he's looking at Tom differently and talking about how truth is not anymore apparent to him, that is elusive and mythical, I think that tells me that he has reevaluated what he thought about Katerina and this is the introduction of Katerina. I also think that the fact that Red took the took the meeting with Tom after knowing, I mean, he had to have known why he needed to talk to him mm -hmm. in Thursday's episode. He had to have known that Howard Hargrave just passed away and suddenly Tom Keene's calling me and needing to talk to me. He knew what it was about. And so the fact that he took that, I mean, he could have very easily said, didn't they tell him I'm busy, you know? And... And that would have been that, I mean, unless Tom tracked him down, I mean, but he accepted the meeting, he sat there, and he tried to give him very thoughtful advice on it. I mean, Red was going out of his way to give Tom good advice, in Red's point of view, good advice. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that he legitimately, he said last, or he said, uh, you know, a week ago, he said, I, I genuinely care for your for your husband because and then he covered you know because of you because of Agnes but he cares about Tom on some level or another I'm sure there could be tons and tons of debates on what level that is but on a level he cares enough about Tom to take character his... development yep all about character development <laughs> uh, something interesting um and, and you you briefly mentioned this uh, a second ago about the fact that that Tom was so stressed out when he he got to Red I, I thought it was a very interesting thing. I kind of wanted to walk through. It's meltdown is not the right term. I'm trying to think what the right term is for this. Um, but you see the stressors building and building and building to Tom to where he's just like the the look in his eyes in that final scene. He's just haunted and terrified and. I mean, just the expression that he's wearing there, and I think Liz sees it. But we start with just utter denial. I'm not going to say that I, you know, I'm not, not going to pretend to care yeah. for some. I'm not going to pretend to care for, about someone that I don't even know. And when he says that, he gets up, and if you watch him, his in anybody that follows my blog on Tumblr knows mm -hmm. that I am obsessed with body language. I love, and Ryan is fan. Ryan and James are probably the best ones to watch for body language in this show. And just the little ticks that they use, because both of them are very good with small, small oh. motions that say so much. And mm -hmm. when Tom gets up, he's sort of flexing his, his uh, fist back and forth as he's walking to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so he makes the statement, <coughs> and then you can tell he's stressed, you can tell he's not, you know, that he's trying to convince himself of this. And, you know... The conversation with Liz, I know this sounds cold, but I don't care. I, I think he's afraid that if he dives into this, his past is going to risk his future. And Liz And also gives... what he's going to find. Did they get rid of me? Uh, did they love me? Or was it something... Did I do something wrong? Or did they love me? And what is going to do to me? Because he's based his entire life and nobody care about me and... And what happens gonna if be when, shocking. And what happens if when, you know, he finally gets reunited with his mother, she's been picturing this three year old perfect baby boy and she gets Tom Keene, who has serious emotional detachment issues, who is a trained operative, who I mean, Liz loves him, yes, but she knows him. And there's a difference in a woman who has spent the last nearly thirty years picturing her three year old child, this innocent little child 
and to get a man that's gone through everything that he has who has I mean he has a lot of baggage <laughs> and a lot that weighs on him on an emotional level on a, a personality level I mean there it, it has to be terrifying for him and so just better to shove it under the rug and leave it alone shove the emotions down ignore them and convince himself that they don't exist and then he opens Pandora's box and you just watch him through the entire episode build and build and build talking to the and when, when he was talking to the detective my first response is why did you just bust out there and tell this man you don't even really know your Christopher Hargrave and then I stopped and I thought about it as, he's freaking out he's freaking this, out this, freaking out is probably the, the term I'm looking for Tom is having a freak out this is what well, a it's... trained operative that that is very very controlled most of the time looks like in a freak out <laughs> you know? well and you basically and there was there was a lot of pain in that detective and, and you know I also found that that to be a momentous point where he said that because I remember I've been saying for ages you know when people talk about the keen wedding and I've been saying for ages it's not gonna happen again like the full wedding until they can get married with who they really are and this is the first time that Tom Keen has said the words I am Christopher Hargrave yeah it's the first time that he's taking ownership of who he is yeah and that's the, the just the expression on his face the way he goes about it and it's almost like he didn't give himself permission to say it it just rolled off his tongue and he's just he's starting that kind of spiral motion that he and then when Liz walks in after he has all of that she walks in she just kind of got this look on her face like you got a lot of police boxes there sweetheart <laughs> and you go back in Something that was a conversation that was happening on Tumblr that's very interesting was the honey and babe because she did she did go back to using babe this this episode as well. But when she woke up, honey is like, There is something bad I need to tell you. Yeah, honey is is more gentle. It's she was waking him up, she was telling him bad news, and then she called him babe when she walked in. She's, you Mm -hmm. know, babe, I've been thinking about this, and then as soon as she walks up, she goes, Honey, those are police reports. And it just, the, the tone changed, the way she was approaching it was careful, it wasn't accusing him of anything, but you could really tell, I, I really loved that Liz was using her people reading skills on her husband. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, she was very careful, I think she realizes what an, how vulnerable he is right now with all of this, and she is being exceptionally careful to not make it worse she i have been so proud of liz <laughs> throughout this episode with how she's approached that because he really is he's he's on a tipping point that a lot of damage could be done here and he's opened himself up to it and i don't think there's any closing the box now there's only going for there's only finding these answers come hell or high water he's gonna have to find them now and a the that- box that was mentioned by red in last episode mm-hmm. But, um, but I mean, he really has opened that box up. And I think that Liz is the only person that can help him through this. She has a point of view of someone who has always wanted answers. And so she's going to understand that on a deeply emotional level. And she knows him well enough to know how to handle him, how to approach him on these things. It's... I just, I, I cannot express how happy I was <laughs> with the way this episode was written. Well, and, and Liz also showed a lot of character development with Red when she mm. says, um, I, you know, I, 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 she's going to break in there and she's going to give them the information because she owes it to Red. Well, and I think I, it boils back to the fact that he started the episode as being honest with her and she acknowledged that. He said, you know... He gave her the case and explained why he was giving it to her. And she said, thank you for being honest and open about why you're sending us after this. And she took his side the whole time. There was a friendly conversation at the end. I mean, it it was just, he was honest and she was good. (laughs) He just needs to do that more. Yeah. Well, I think that that goes back to, to Red 
you know, I, I've, I've often said, but I wanted to just talk about Liz and then I go into what I was thinking about Red and, and his spiraling, is that um, Liz had really gone to, to length in here. We, we don't often see her because she does a little bit of the same kind of rubber banding that the wrestler does back and forth. But I think that Liz has really come into her own. And I think that this this is eventually going to end up into Liz having to choose between who to what really she is. And I think that at one point she's going to have to choose between being like Red or being an FBI agent. And I think that everything that Ray has done is for her to be an FBI agent and she might surprise him by deciding that that's not who she is. It, it will come back as she start exploring, I think, more of her mom. I think that that is that side of her that she's still looking for. And again, I go back on my crazy theory that, you know, Carla might have been one of the identities of Katerina is that in the episode where we introduce when 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 uh, Liz goes and talks again with her, it's the episode that Dr. Creel is talking about the importance of uh, spending time with your parents. And there we got, and we got a reunion. Red is talking about opening a bottle of Chardonnay. So that, you know, it's, it's, it's all very, very interesting. If you go with that theory, it makes perfect sense that Red is actually coming apart at the seams. If you think about it, Liz had been pushing him aside. Um, he may have re-examined what he did about Katerina, how he really didn't give her a chance, because I have a feeling that Red was angry. Red thought she had, she had, a uh, uh, she had been um, not loyal to him and just shut her off. Just stash her somewhere and I don't care. I don't want to talk to you about it. I don't want to hear reasons. You were disloyal to me. And all this working out with Tom has come to that conclusion. He doesn't know what is true anymore. Everything that he held true, the things that Mostly like we've seen in Samar, like we've seen with Wrestler, like we've seen with Cooper and his marriage coming apart. Red, now Red is coming to this. Everything that I base my life on maybe wasn't true. Maybe it wasn't real. Maybe I, I did jump to a conclusion that I shouldn't have. And if Emma is really Jennifer, Emma gave, Emma told her she doesn't want anything to do with him. She was willing to steal a witness protection list and give a former MII six agent and give it to and sell it to the highest bidder. Um, Liz didn't want anything to do with him. Denby was pretty angry with him. That's another child, a figure that he has. And now he's not maybe not sure that she he treated Katerina at least give her a chance. I'll say that he's coming apart at the seams. And I think and we I saw that in him going after. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his friend's name. Is Santo something close to that? Uh, S S oh, yes. <laughs> what, was that it? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm blanking on his name. Um, but but Stratus. His, Stratus. 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 Um, but uh, in the in the desperation he had to save him, and mm -hmm. I mean it went. And that's one of the things I've always really liked about Red is that he. With the exception of Kate, and I think that was kind of an exception to everything. Um, there are so many other factors that go into that. But he takes care of his people. He knows them. He knows them by name. He knows who they are. He knows their family. He cares about their families. He cares what happened. You know, early on, Liz called him a loner, and I think we've seen that that is certainly not the case. He may not have... They may not know as much about him, but he always knows about them, and he seems to genuinely care about what he finds out about them and remember these things. And I think that that was... He set his friend up 
to go to this place. He was going on a job for him. He'd given him an anniversary present. And and comments on how he loves that relationship and yeah, he's envious and, of it. And the man's wife died. He's thrown in prison, you know, framed for the murder. And Red's like, I'm not going to wait on the FBI to do this. They're not going to be able to get him out. I'm going in for him. And then he dies. He gets shot and dies in Red. Well, not he, in Red's no, arms. No, he gets shot. He gets shot. He wants the gun in a scene very reminiscent of Kate giving him the gun and leaving him when he had been shot. And then the friend shot himself. So I think so. I mean, but, yeah. oh my gosh, can we just talk about James in that moment? That expression oh on his face? <laughs> <sighs> All about that to James such a master. He is such a master. Those, I mean, this episode for him, the range that he <sighs> went... We got campy red, we got undercover red, we got, you know, uh, uh, father-in-law red, father red. It was just awesome. So much love. So much love for it. it he was just brilliant. And I I just sat there and uh, Dimbe having to drag him away because he almost went back. I mean, mm-hmm. the guy's dead, and he almost went back because it clicked with him what just happened. Mm-hmm. I think he thought that, that he was going to fight his way Well, I think he thought he was going to fight his way out, and I don't know. Maybe he just I, – I don't know what Red was thinking then. But it, it was just, that shotgun, that, you, that, that shot that you knew the guy has just killed himself. Yeah. Right, and that just taking a life. And then to get on the plane and, – and don't get me wrong – I understand why Cooper went after him like he did. I understand it from Cooper's point of view. and But to ha- immediately he gets on the plane. You see him pouring himself a drink because he's just so broken he's over shaking. this. His hand is shaking. Yeah. And to have Cooper go, yeah, we were going to handle it. You went in and you got him killed. And then immediately to have Dembe say, everybody's dying around you. I'm just like, can you please give this poor man a moment to breathe and grieve? Yeah. I'm he just doesn't like, have them. I know, but it just, it was, I understand why it all happened from a writing point of view, but I'm just like, excuse me, I'm going to take Red right now, and I'm going to hug him and give him a protective blanket and make sure the world does not harm him anymore. <laughs> yeah, this, just, that, that was a heartbreaking right moment. Then. And I, I want to say, now that we mentioned in, uh, Kate, I just want to say briefly something. In in the in the scenes with, with Kate, Kate, when Kate gets shot... Kate and Red are both wearing plaids. And the the forest guy is also wearing plaid shirts. I don't know that there is not much in there that we don't know, but something is just bothering me because I have not been able to understand why plaid there. It's one of the few that I don't know. Something is not as it seems. Patience. Same, same as with the guy that beats Lisa up. In uh, in um, the van, mm-hmm. or no, Gregory Debra, right? Gregory Debra, yeah. I think yeah. it's at the end of Gregory Debra, yeah. Yep. And the guy wears plaids on both occasions, so something is not as it seems, and I don't know what it is. So there, something I don't know, mm. I don't have a theory about. <laughs> but yeah, um, and so I, I think the last last thing we have on our docket here. Uh, the the last thing on here was the the red and and Liz conversation over the cuckoo clock. <gasps> what a beautiful beautiful scene! Mm, it's it was... so much longing and there is. I mean, if you really think about it, Red has been tortured because it's almost worse to have lost a child than to not even be able to tell her. I am your father. That must be, you know, have your child hate you. Have your child not understand what you're doing. And, and all this time, all you want is a meal together and, and hold your granddaughter. And this man can have that. And it he is- just lost it, all that loss right there. I was so happy that Liz was oh. kind to him in that moment. I'm like, thank you. Somebody's nice to him right now. <laughs> and it's Liz. Yay. <laughs> I, just... I, I, I think this is all setting up to that great episode um, where Red gets 
uh, poison because I think that Dembe is getting to the point where Dembe is going to make a decision for Red. I mean, at this point is, you know, there, there comes a time in each child as you get older and you see your parents getting older and, and at some point you stop being the protected and you start being the protector. And I'm seeing Dembe starting to see that. Yeah. I, I read is there is something in red that is collapsing. And I think the source of that collapse is that re understanding we have had about Katerina. Well, I mean, it, we, we won't know until the episode airs, obviously, but there's a great potential for a, a parallel between what's about to happen with him getting poisoned and when he got shot in season two. Mm -hmm. So much came out and Dembe did. He took it into his own hands and said, you need to Same. go to this apartment and he opened it up for Liz to find out certain things. So I could definitely, I agree. I could definitely see Dembe taking it into his own hands and going, you need to know. And that would certainly be a very interesting thing, especially if red disappears at the end of the episode or something going into the, into the mm -hmm. redemption arc, the, to have that knowledge drop down on Liz and then red's gone just gone be interesting um we'll i see how like it, it. Out. <laughs> you know, i like it and i like it a lot <laughs> yeah and so we'll see how oh, it goes yeah out. but that that i, I like that that seems like to this, make sense like... to me for for because i've been trying i've been racking my brain for a way that they could go into it because because redemption's so tightly woven in You've got that time in there that you've got to account for that you don't have. Is it weeks? Something is happening. They, they've done it. They managed it before. Like when at the beginning of, um, of Lord Baltimore, he says four four months, and this is what he gives you. So we know that they can do it, but that would be a great way of doing it. He just, I mean, we don't know if he's alive. We don't know if he's dead. Maybe, you know, and, and then Liz knows, but he, she can't get in touch with him. Yeah. I love that idea. And maybe Red doesn't even know that she knows. That would be an interesting twist. Yes. That would be. Because... A... And exactly. then you'd parallel with redemption with Tom knowing about Scotty, Scotty not knowing about Tom. I like it. Come on, writers. I hope you went that way. <laughs> so when did you think that Tom, that Rick found out who Tom was? Oh, I, we've discussed this before. I, But now we got more information. We do, and I still don't have a definite answer for you, but I I would wager around the time that he found out about Agnes. I, I You've mentioned that before, that you think that, that he did that, you know, that he did his research when, when Agnes came into play. And I agree. I mean, because we started seeing him shift. He saved Tom after the heist. Um, granted, he was still telling Liz that Tom had no place in Agnes's life, begging her not to, to follow through with the wedding. I mean, so I don't know. It could have been during that point. I don't know. But interesting fact that, um, that you had mentioned off the podcast before was we did get a confirmation that Red does know that Tom is both Howard and Scotty's son. Or at least he believes yeah. that. Yes. And so uh, Howard Hargrave is Tom's father. Scotty Hargrave is Tom's yep. mother. And and just reading on those on those um, uh, clippings that he's reading, I gotta say I was wrong. Howard does not seem to have been an intelligent. Howard apparently is the the oldest son of a very very wealthy family. His his father had a, a company called Hargrave Industries, and they were manufacturers of of weapons. Uh, and something the competitors took over, and they went. And Howard was the one who started when he was very young into um, into the private intelligence business. So. Just broke my heart i was trying because I, I got a few screen caps if you're looking for them they're on tumblr mm -hmm. um they weren't it's it's hard to catch it just right when you're recording off amazon to to get clear uh the the howard hargrave one's pretty clear pretty easy to read the whole article they had up um but you can read pieces of the christopher one and you can read pieces of scotty's but there's one on christopher's that mm -hmm. there's a little bit a quote from scotty in the newspaper because it's talking about them being 
you know, which I found interesting because they were renting a house there, but it also said they were very active in that community. And um, so I do know people vacate, you know, that they'll have, they, they vacation regularly at these places during the summer and they rent instead of buy. So, I mean, I'm assuming that's kind of, you know, wealthy families tend to do that. Um, so I'm assuming that's what, what the Hargraves did when Christopher was young. But there was a quote from Scotty in there saying that uh, wherever he was, uh, we, we want our, uh, mommy wants you to come home or something like that. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, there was also just, oh. something in there about Chris. There, there'd been a, a, another ten or twelve children in the area that had been taking and vanished without a trace, which is what I think is what happens. They use that to whoever took him, and for whatever reason, when they start investigating, I think that they pay this guy or they found this guy and hid. Christopher like that. I honestly think this they were somebody was trying to keep him safe and he something went terribly wrong, which is what I was kept saying about um Agnes and with Matthew and Romina. It's like anything can happen. I mean, if that if that if they have capsized in that little boat, a somebody a stranger could have taken her and she would have been lost forever. How are you gonna find her? Yeah, exactly. And so something interesting I was thinking about when I was watching that Richard game. Um, mm-hmm. the, who is that Richard game? He killed me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Poor Tom. Am I a murder me? Um, but um, I don't know. I, I I was very uncomfortable Googling this, but I did. Um, if there is a longer prison sentence for people who murder children than who murder, murder adults, I really don't know. Um, yes. I would assume that there probably is. I I mean, just because and if you for should, nothing they else, don't, they, the don't, kick, they don't last in prison. Yeah, uh, well, and the guy may not have gotten out, but if he survived his prison sentence, there's a good chance he's back on the streets. It'd be interesting to see if he pops back up. Most most of the time, people who, who murder or molest children, they get in jail and they don't come out. Yeah, and that's a possibility. But that would be I mean, very they gotta interesting. they got to be protected. I have a feeling that the guy may have just taken the blame um, for in exchange for something for his family, for a relative. We saw that in season two. Red did that with Samuel Leco. He got yes. him to take the blame for, for Liz and Tom. Or, well, pretty mm-hmm. much for Tom, but for Liz's, you know, part in it, tiny part that she had. Um, well, ish. Eh, that's sorry. That's a whole other <laughs> Whole other conversation if it's a big part or a small part. Look at the, the podcast we did yeah, that. Exactly. We've been over this. Um but but Red got Aleko to take the blame for the death of the harbor master. Um in exchange for helping his brother. And so it could have been something along those lines. Mm. I, I'm thinking that that there was something. Uh, he also mentioned some very interesting things about about um Howard and Susan. He said that Howard wrestle with significant demons. That's so interesting. And then talk about Susan as being a manip- manipulative creature whose own husband didn't trust her. And that was like, oh, I think you're describing yourself, honey, there. Um, I, I Because I think that there was something there. I, I've always had this thing that Susan and Katerina were... Um, you know, they, they both were undercover agents and they use the name Scott. Maybe they pose as sisters. And um, so I wonder if Tom, who decided to remain Tom Keen, is not a parallel with his mother who decided to remain Susan Scott Hargrave. It'll be interesting to see. Um, because, I mean, she definitely is a manipulative individual. We saw that in season three when Scotty came up. And I'm... I am so excited to move forward with this because I both, I I really want, and I desperately want Howard to be good. I mean, this this is just where I'm coming from as a fan. I love, love father-son relationships that are rocky. That's like my trope. That's one of them. Um, Like, you see them all through my fandoms that I go through. (laughs) So, that's, if there's a, if there's a difficult father-son relationship, I'm all over that. 
Um, I don't know why. What if, it's just my what if Howard was the one who decided that he was better off in the streets and in foster care than with his mother? I don't think that. I, I really, from what we know of everybody, I don't think that. I, I think it's a possibility, like you theorized before, that one of them was trying to protect him and that he got lost. I don't think there was anything that he was Yo, like, well, let's just toss you into the system. Bye. Good luck, kid. You know, <laughs> I don't get that no, impression. I, I think there is more than that. But I find interesting that because we have had some of those, we've had uh, Lady Ambrosia. Mm-hmm. And that was interesting, you know, it was a parent that won them, a parent that won them. And I'm, I'm, what I'm finding is they go, because a lot of people tend to think, oh, the blacklisted number means, you know, they're more important, they're more dangerous. No, it's a story being told. Um, that, is, that is the story of Red's life being told to, to Liz. And something, something fascinating, and I don't know if it really – it's something that my brain picked up on that I don't know how accurate it is, like how, how well I'm reading it or not. Just to make the note, though, um, Richard Game was was commenting about when he walked into to little Christopher's mm-hmm. room and just the way he was describing how Christopher woke up and just looked at him with with a look like he knew him. And then he started fighting. It just it like I've always wondered. I. I know that a lot of Tom's issues come from the way he was raised, that they, you know, that, that a lot of the emotional disconnection probably stems from that. But he's also the son of people that are deeply manipulative. I mean, they have, I bet you if you, you dig into Howard and Scotty, there are some emotional peculiarity, pe- pe- peculiarities. Peculiarities. Yeah. There's the word. Um, <laughs> with them. And just... I mean, I, I got this mental image of this little three-year-old boy with this person walking in and just that blank look Tom gets when he's studying somebody. You know, it, he just kind of, he has this look when he's watching someone and reading their their <laughs> tells. And, like, little Christopher was already doing that. And it's it'll be fascinating to see if they go that route, that they're, you know... Scotty said perfect little baby boy, but I'll be interested to see if Christopher was as perfect as a toddler as Scotty seems to be remembering him. Or if there was already sort of a, a disconnect there. A, a... Well, I, I am not clinical psychologist, but you Well, I'm not me. either. <laughs> but I, I know that I've, I've read online, um, and this is early on in the blacklist, probably the first few months when the blacklist was going on. And, and there was a lot of discussion in uh, how children who have had significant trauma and have been abandoned in a in a period of time tend to have problems of attachment it is i think it's called attachment um um, yeah i know know what you're talking about yeah yeah and and that that was discussed a lot with with liz and i think with tom it goes very well so i don't think that there is anything i don't think that that just the fact that tom is said to have had um psychopathic uh tendencies and uh, he wasn't supposed to be emotionally connected. I don't think that that's supposed to mean that is part that happened as a result. Yes, he does have tendencies because he's the child of these people. They gotta have it, like Liz. No, I I do agree. I think that probably most of that stems from the trauma, and we don't. We have no idea what he went through after he was no. taken. We have no idea if they dropped him immediately into the system or if they held him captive or if they hurt him. I mean, we have no idea what happened to Tom. And I got so, an idea. Well, we have ideas. We don't We don't know. <laughs> but, oh, I mean, God, I got crazy I, theories. I, I get kind of frustrated when, when people are like, well, that's an excuse. His past is an excuse for his current behavior. And I'm like, well, you've still got to take that into account. This guy has been through a lot of trauma. It's going to affect him emotionally. And it's going to affect his emotional, uh, his, um, 
growth. I mean, yeah. and, and it, it did. It very it did. obviously did. And it's been, he's in his 30s now and is learning things he should have learned as a teenager or younger than that. And <laughs> but they, they do this exact same thing to Liz. I mean, they get upset. It's like, why don't she be grateful or this or that? It's like, people, I mean, put yourself in, in their shoes. The, the thing is, sometimes it's hard for, for people to separate with we, the audience, know with what the characters know. Yeah. And, and it's always important to take a look at what the characters know and what the characters have been through. That's like going crazy over a wrestler. You should be understanding that, you know, sometimes you need to do to go with the bad guys to do good. Yes, in your perspective, but not from the character one. Exactly. Um, I, I got on, on a very uh, weird idea. I, it hasn't even got to a theory. It's just a very weird idea that something in the night of the fire... Um, this connects me from the from the the argument, and is that when Red talks about the argument of the night of the fire, he talks about them wanting to be back together, being a family. We heard nothing of this, so I'm thinking that Liz may have still blocked the real argument of the night of the fire, and. That she's just basically mixing arguments from, you know, a period of time with her parents, from the moment in which Red had taken her and Katerina finds them, all the way through the fire, and she's making them as if they're the same argument. Um, I find that difficult because we see Liz actually sitting down three times. So to me, that means there are three arguments and she spends a lot of time in closets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she once again, daughter of spies. She's spying exactly. on her folks. <laughs> yeah. that, but the weird thing that kind of occurred to me is that I know that there is another person with her in the closet in, in two of those occasions. And I tend to assume it's Jennifer because it won't make sense. But what if the last time that you only basically just see eyes, you don't see anything else, if that person is Tom? What if... The reason Red takes Liz from Katerina in 1989 is because Christopher had been taken in 1988. And suddenly he is concerned that maybe this is not safe and he takes Liz. What if those children are again taken from them and the night of the fire is a rescue operation gone wrong? Because why everybody's wearing coats except Liz? What if Tom was with her in that closet? And yes, they do feel like family. Maybe they were the last, they were together and they hold on to each other. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, that what would be. What if the night of the fire, Tom got lost because it was supposed to be, you know, kept by this person and that's how he got lost. Somebody got Liz out and left him. Oh. Red was supposed to save him and couldn't. Oh. Red, Red was face down in the snow. Yeah, I mean, can't blame him, him if he got shot. I, I mean. think that maybe, maybe they left him for dead as well. I mean, we don't know, but something in this whole thing is starting to point yeah. to certain uh, threats being picked up and, and pointing in different directions. And it's very interesting. Oh, it's just crazy things. By the way, have you noticed how we have picked up a lot of nautical and, and uh, water? In the last ep few episodes, everything is being about water. Ships and drownings and pools. and mm -hmm. um, It's just great. I really, I'm going to be very fascinated. I saw some of the uh, preview photos for, for Redemption. <gasps> where, uh, <gasps> where Tom and, and uh, Solomon in wetsuits. And I'm going, I really hope he's either learned to swim or that they, you know, I mean, because I can't imagine after that. It was such a big statement, you know. I I feel like, I, I really hope it comes back around, that either he learned how to swim somewhere or Solomon just shoves him in. <laughs> he doesn't come back up. <laughs> and that's, you know. <laughs> wouldn't that be hey, hilarious? Don't know if how to, re to swim? Oops. Wouldn't that be hilarious if Solomon saved his life? <laughs> Tom's like, I hate you so much. 
Oh, yeah, I could see that one. <laughs> oh, I mean, but Sullivan finds out because he just goes, whoop. <laughs> Tom goes in, doesn't come back up, come, goes in, saves him. And, <laughs> oh, well, I Tom think would that never we- live it down. I think that when when we got that that promo picture of Tom Wet, I think that's what he meant. Because the thing is, when would he have learned at this point? I mean, he was like, if he had been on that boat for a while, he might have. But he was gone like maybe a day, maybe. But I mean, no, I mean, think about that, Tom. Liz tells him, "Oh, I hate that that tattoo, the the swastika." You know, who wouldn't? Uh, and next day, the thing is gone. And then, you know, Liz points out you don't know how to swim. So maybe he just, next day he went and signed up for classes. I I still go back to the, I think that there's something deeper about the swimming. I really do. And, I mean, obviously it was used as a metaphor, but there is something wrong with a spy that can't swim. Why would he not be able to swim? Why would why he had to have gone out of his way to avoid any sort of water training in mm-hmm. in Saint Regis? I mean, because think about it, th- there are certain scenarios in which an undercover operative would need to know. He had mm-hmm. to have gone well out of his way to manipulate his way out of b- those lessons, and so it there has yeah. to be some sort of trauma tied back to that. I I and the fact that he was lost on a beach, I just keep going. And he loved that. the water. He loved the water as a kid, but as an adult, he can't swim. There is something about that, and I and we have that horroring scene of 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 Agnes being taken on that horrendous boat with his two people. Um, but yeah, and so I, I really do hope Redemption dives back into that. You know, pun not intended until I said it, and then it was. Yeah, um, it, worked, it worked well. You should have yeah, just like. <laughs> Um. <laughs> all in all, I'm super excited for for the remaining of the season. I think that you know the 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 people people should be a little more patient. And I, I tell you, I'm seeing it, and I know that a lot of the things that I'm I say, you have to believe that I'm that my theory has any legs in order to even understand what I'm saying. But from where I'm standing. Everything is coming together. Every single little piece is coming together, and I am so excited. And I don't know that I'm getting everything right. I still have my doubts about Carla being Katerina just because it's so brazen. I mean, they just, I mean, think about it. They just introduced Red's wife. That should have been big. And then she's dropped. They, you know, they talk about his daughter. It's dropped. They put Liz's grandfather. is gone. And then, uh, and then I'm thinking, could it be? I mean, that is just huge. But it's blacklist. Yeah. Yep. And this is all for today. Uh, we invite you to uh, leave us notes, questions, uh, anything that you would like us to touch on. And you can listen to us in SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes. And, of course, leave us um, face. We are in Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Leave us any notes and come back and listen to us for the podcast 21, in which hopefully we'll be even more excited. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, Dave Metzger is the writer. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Metzger's writing. I love Drexel. And so that's, that's all. So this is why. another combo of, of, um, of Taylor and Dave. Yes. Uh, t- Taylor and then Dave, because she did Lady Ambrosia and, and then she did this week Isabella Stone and then Dave did Drexel and he's doing next week which is the architect and so yeah we've got the the double combo there and so that's that's exciting so we'll see you next week and hopefully we'll be super excited too and everybody will be too all right we'll see you next week have a good week mm-hmm. bye bye